Welcome to this uh, capnography tutorial. This is going to be part one. We're going to cover pretty much everything uh, about capnography. We're going to review the respiratory system really briefly, learn the different terms of capnography, uh, learn the uses, review confirmation of intubation because that's what capnography is currently being used for uh, mostly in the uh, emergency field, uh, emergency medicine and in emergency medical services. Uh, we're also going to review the ventilatory, circulatory, and metabolism uses because there really are a lot more uses for capnography than just ventilation alone. Uh, and then we might have a, a few practice scenarios at the end to really drive home some of the points. So the respiratory system, you exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide. Everybody kind of knows that you breathe in oxygen. Uh, at the alveolar level, you exchange that oxygen for car carbon dioxide. Uh, so then the oxygen now enters the blood and is circulated throughout the body. And then at the tissue level, or the capillaries are, again, you exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide. Uh, this time, CO2 enters the blood, travels throughout the body, uh, back to the lungs, and you exhale that carbon dioxide. Kind of seems uh, confusing when I say it all at once, but I think everybody kind of gets that idea. You breathe in oxygen, that oxygen needs to go to the different tissues of your body, and you need to get rid of carbon dioxide. Well, because of this process, that kind of explains the whole reason we're obtaining these end CO2 values. We're obtaining capnography uh, from the CO2 we're expiring. So that means if you're expiring CO2 at some point, you exchanged oxygen for that CO2. So you know there's a lot of processes occurring to give you that CO2 value. So the heart pumps the freshly oxygenated blood throughout the body to the cells where oxygen is consumed. That's called metabolism. So this is why uh, capnography can give you kind of an idea about cellular metabolism. No, you're not going to really be able to see at the cellular level what's happening, but you know that you must be metabolizing oxygen to be producing CO2 if you're getting capnography values. Just like we know that if you're getting CO2 values, you must have some sort of ventilation taking place because without ventilation, you can't get that air out. You can't get that CO2 out and that oxygen in. Carbon dioxide rich blood is then pumped through the pulmonary capillary bed where the carbon dioxide diffuses across the alveolar capillary membrane. It's just a fancy way of saying that in the lungs, oxygen and CO2 kind of are exchanged. So you, you uh, have oxygen go from your lungs into your uh, circulatory system and CO2 out of the circulatory system into the lungs so you can get rid of it. Capnometry. So you, there's a few different words used in capnography. You have capnography, capnometry, capnogram. So capnometry is the actual number, the numeric value, okay? It's quantitative. It gives you how much carbon dioxide uh, in millimeters per mercury reading, same as blood pressure, millimeters per mercury. Uh, it, it lets you how, know how much of it is actually being expired. And that number will be important, as you'll see. So capnometry is the numeric value, and it usually shows up with the capnogram. The capnogram or capnograph is the actual uh, waveform, and that is also important. So it's good to have both. You know, if you can only have one, you know, that's fine. But if you could have both, you, that, that would be optimal because you're going to want the capnometry, the numeric reading, and you're going to want that waveform because different waveforms, much like an EKG, can indicate different pathologies. So it's it's maybe not as far along as EKG interpretation where there's so many different things, a vast array of different pathologies you could pick up on from EKG interpretation, but there are a number of different things, you know, a limited number that you can pick up on from capnography, so it's a great tool. The capnogram measures expired CO2, as I said, and the plateau signifies expiration. So as you see from here, B to C, that's kind of your plateau. And then your C value is actually going to be where you get your entitled CO2, as we'll see. Entitled CO2, sometimes referred to as this PECO2, um, that's, that's your abbreviation ETCO2 or PECO2. CO2 is carbon dioxide, C is carbon, O is oxygen, and there's two, so it's dioxide. 
uh, carbon dioxide is the byproduct of all metabolism and is eliminated by exhaling. So it's like your exhaust, so to speak. You know, it's the, it's the byproduct of combustion uh, in the body or, or metabolism. So oxygen, as we said, goes to your body tissues, cellular metabolism takes place, carbon dioxide is produced and taken to the lungs, and that's where we get our reading, and then you get oxygen back in the lungs, and the process continues. I think everybody kind of gets that point by now. Uh, entitled CO2 equals C on the image below. So if you look here, at the peak value of this plateau is your end tidal CO2. If you think about the word end tidal, it's saying at the end of the tidal volume that you're exhaling, because you don't exhale all the air in your lungs, but what you do exhale is your tidal volume, and at the end of that tidal volume is the number that you're getting, your C value on this picture. The highest level of expired CO2 is your entitled CO2. CO2 is detected with infrared sensors. Uh, there's two different kinds. There's side stream and there's bait stream. Um, mainstream CO2 will give you uh, the sampling of CO2 right at the device you're using. So if you're using like a, an ET tube, an endotracheal tube, and you have a device attached directly to it, and it, it's not taking a sample away from it. It's giving you the reading right there at the ET tube. That's mainstream. Side stream takes a sample through like a thin little tube all the way back to a monitor. The Zoll monitors, LifePak monitors, Philips monitors, they all use this side stream where it takes a sample back to the monitor. And then there's an infrared light somewhere at that monitor. Maybe there's a module on the side or something like that. And it kind of reads the entitled CO2 or the capnography number from that. So the different uses of capnography, because this is important, uh, you can use it to confirm ET tube placement or endotracheal tube placement. I think everybody kind of gets that by now. It is somewhat the gold standard. I mean, you want to visualize the tube going through. You want to listen to lung sounds and see misting in the tube and an improvement in patient condition, all of this stuff. But you definitely want to confirm it with capnography. Capnography is great because all of those other things, you're just documenting and it's very subjective from you or objective uh, information that you're providing based on uh, your own assessment and your own eyes and your own ears. Uh, however, with capnography, you can actually attach you know, your monitor file to your report and show that you are getting capnography values. You can't really argue that. Okay, short of having your partner breathing into the capnography fee device to get numbers, which I do not recommend doing, um, you know, it's pretty 100% that you either have or did not have a good uh, endotracheal innovation. Of course, there's always malfunctions and everything, but, you know, it's just uh, the nature of technology. It measures ventilation measures ventilation. It doesn't just tell you that somebody's ventilating. It can actually tell you the quality of their ventilation. It can tell you the ventilatory rate. There's a lot of, you know, great stuff that cap capnography can do uh, and, and tell you about ventilation. It's an assessment tool. And like all assessment tools, you know, it, it, it has a certain limit to what it can provide as far as information goes. But if you narrow your, your scope into that limit and see all the great things it can provide, it will really improve your overall assessment abilities. A measure of cardiac output. That's right, it will measure cardiac output somewhat. You know, it's not blood pressure, uh, but it can tell you if somebody's perfusing and lower values uh, certainly indicate lower levels of perfusion. So the values can, can tell you a few different things. It can tell you about ventilation, cardiac output, and cellular metabolism. And when you're getting these values, you need to take everything into account. So if somebody's breathing really fast, that might be the reason for a lower uh, entitled CO2 value. However, if somebody's got a normal respiratory rate and they have a low entitled CO2 value, maybe they're in shock because there are, there are conditions such as shock that can give you low uh, entitled CO2 values. So it's a good measurement of cardiac output. In fact, if somebody's in cardiac arrest, full cardiac arrest, their values, even when being ventilated, will be very low. And the reason that they're very low is because they're not circulating blood. Since that blood's not circulating, they can't really have good cellular metabolism. 
And it's also telling you, it's, it's also giving you low values because there is no cellular metabolism taking place with cardiac arrest. Um, and if you can't circulate the CO2, you're going to get low CO2 readings. If you can't metabolize the, the uh, oxygen for CO2, well, you're not going to have a whole lot of CO2 to give good CO2 readings either. And if you can't ventilate that CO2 out, you're also going to get very low readings because you can't get that air out. So there's a lot of different reasons that you can have an alteration in your normal entitled CO2. Continuous waveform capnography is recommended in addition to clinical assessment as the most reliable method of confirming and monitoring correct placement of an ET tube. I think we've kind of beaten this to death already. The 2010 AHA guidelines uh, recommended as a class one recommendation. Also, uh, studies on waveform capnography have shown 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity in identifying uh, correct ET tube placement. Again, color metric devices, you know those little color metric yellow to purple, purple to yellow devices, uh, should only be used when you can't use the waveform capnography. So we're, we're talking about this as two separate things. Yes, the color metric capnography is a type of capnography, but it's not nearly as good as waveform capnography. It's worlds apart. It is reasonable con to consider this capnography device to show return of spontaneous circulation. Return of spontaneous circulation. When is that important? With your cardiac arrest patient. If you're working a code, get them on capnography. So important. Because you can be doing CPR and still note whether a pulse returns or not. Not all the time, but if a, a person regains circulation when you're doing CPR, that will give them a spike in entitled CO2 values a spike in entitled CO2 values. So you won't have to stop CPR to check for a pulse. Not that you should be doing that anyways. But if you get that spike in entitled CO2 values, it's actually a great indicator that the patient regained a pulse. And then it would be okay to stop CPR and confirm that. We're going to talk about that uh, more later on. Uh, if PET CO2, remember that's the same as saying entitled CO2, is abruptly increased sorry, to a normal value, it is reasonable to consider that this is an indicator of return of spontaneous circulation. That's a class 2A recommendation from AHA, the American Heart Association. And I will tell you right now that it will increase to greater than these numbers. Greater than these numbers. It'll increase, I've seen it up to 90. That's right, an entitled CO2 of 90 on somebody that regained uh, a pulse during cardiac arrest or following cardiac arrest. So that's it for, for part one. Uh, I want you to just kind of take on those points. We're going to actually get into the capnography values a little bit more in part two and, and really talk about the use of the device.